graduate diploma program in work and labor and a specialist at the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. We are grateful for the support of Cup W and Gig Workers United in helping us put this event on. And I also want to thank and recognize Jane Stinson, um, an instructor who's in the Work and Labor Program, and Tabitha Mallowin, the Institute's administrator, for their key roles in putting today's event together. We hope that creating a space for discussion, for combining theory and practice, for sharing analysis and thinking big, will be of value to the labor community and to everyone else concerned about the future of work and of workers. We hope that our discussions today will help provide some insights into what's happening to help us see specific struggles in a broader context and also help us better understand how to act to support workers, their families and their communities striving for decent wages and other conditions of employment. Uh, one technical thing of note, we are uh, conducting this meeting as a regular Zoom meeting uh, rather than a formal webinar. So please do keep your video and audio off until the Q&A uh, and we recommend turning speaker view on. So now I would like to introduce our moderator, Kevin Matthews, a student enrolled in the Work and Labor Diploma Program while also working full-time for the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. Kevin is a perfect moderator for today's session. He knows both panelists and their work well, in one case through the university and in the other uh, through uh, labor connections. And Kevin, I will let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin, and thanks to the Institute. I appreciate the introduction, very insightful and uh, very much along the lines of how we want to set the table for today's discussion. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited to be here and to be doing this. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, we've had some good discussions over the last few days, uh, the two panelists and I, about the complementary perspectives that they have to offer. And they're going to share on gig worker organizing and in the big picture and the future of, of labor organizing in that space. A um, um, couple of other uh, housekeeping notes about Zoom. Um, Justin mentioned a few things. The, the chat box, as you may notice, is open. Um, We'll, uh, we'll ask you when the time comes, we're trying to save 30 to 40 minutes at the end for Q&A. So when the time comes, we'll ask you to raise your hand to pose questions, but the chat box is there. It's useful for sharing resources, comments, and so on, um, but we'll try not to let it sidetrack us from the main discussion. So I and the two panelists might not be monitor monitoring the chat very strictly. We'll be focusing on uh, on the main presentation. Uh, recording is on, you may have noticed as well. So if you don't wish to be recorded, you can always keep your audio off and or your video, even if you just choose to ask a question. Um, if you want to do it in another way because you don't wish to be recorded, we'll be open to that. And live transcript is enabled. You'll see um, in one of the menus, in one of the menus at the bottom of your screen is the live transcript menu. And so you can turn on the, the captions if that's helpful to you. So, um, I'm going to start, I think, uh, uh, Jennifer Scott is, is an app delivery worker and organizer and president of Gig Workers United. And Jennifer, as you and I both know, it's sometimes difficult to define uh, the gig economy in, in terms that we can act on. But um, one way to make that less complicated would be to start with the specifics of uh, whom you're organizing, which workers we're actually talking about today, and uh, whom you represent with Gig Workers United. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'm a gig worker, and that means that I deliver food and sometimes groceries on my bicycle. I, I work in Toronto, um, and I work on apps like Uber Eats and DoorDash and Skip the Dishes and Corner Shop. But being part of Gig Workers United, uh, my fellow union members, my coworkers, we work in all different ways across a whole bunch of different apps. So uh, sometimes we deliver by walking or by e-bicycle or in car on apps like Instacart mm -hmm. and um, FOD and you know all of all of those <laughs> that whole list of all those apps. But who we are is, is people who use our own vehicles to deliver things in the app-based economy. And those are the folks that we're talking about today. Okay, that's really helpful. I know pe people still may have some questions about what the specific boundaries of the gig economy writ large might be, but that's very helpful because we're talking about, you know, real organizing with real workers and it's good to know exactly what the scope is. So Zoe, in your paper, which 
really provides uh, a lot of the framework for this panel today. You um, situate the Gig Workers United struggle within a continuum of modes of organizing. And uh, how do you, maybe you can just sort of re recap a bit how, how that continuum looks and how you situate the work of GWU uh, within it. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Jennifer and everyone for being here. So I guess to try to keep it short, the, um, in this paper that Kevin's referring to, I examined three ongoing efforts to improve the rights of gig workers in Ontario through labor scholar and organizer Jane McAlevey's framework for successful organizing, which she outlines in her book, No Shortcuts. Um, and through researching the like struggles, like gig worker struggles, I've really just been so inspired by Gig Workers United and their radical community engaged approach approach to organizing. Their emphasis on community unionism is something that we can all learn a lot from, and I'm so excited to be talking about it today. Um, and so in the paper, I kind of fall, I ended up arguing that Gig Workers United see, like, possess the most potential for radical change uh, within not just the gig economy, but as a model for organizing because of this community oriented approach. Um, but to kind of understand the importance of this more kind of multifaceted organizing tactic, I think um, a few key points about the gig economy and precarious work um, in general. Uh, so the gig economy, and the precarious work it encapsulates can be understood as an acceleration of the changes that mark the shift from the Keynesian welfare state model to neoliberalism. And this notion of offloading costs and risks onto workers and consumers, reducing waste, right, AKA money, um, which is taken to the extreme in the Uber and gig work model can be traced back to the popularization of lean business practices from the 1980s onwards, as well as the many structural changes that mark the shift from the welfare state era to the to neoliberalism. And like with this, what we can broadly describe as an increased kind of market depend like labor market dependence and weakening of social protection um like unions were already increasingly relegated to a very constrained um and kind of reformist role for many factors that are beyond this current um discussion at least for now and a big factor in this whole in the kind of de decline of organized labor that is often associated with the neoliberal era is um, the rise of business unionism, which focuses narrowly on the interest members within the workplace, um, in contrast to social or community unionism, which is characterized by a more, by a commitment to more radical social and economic change. And so this is where McAlevey's um, framework comes in and is really useful to understand um, what she outlines is three approaches to change, advocacy, mobilizing, and organizing. And she contends that advocacy and mobilizing have become the prevailing strategies used by social movements, including some labor movements over the past half century, despite the fact that these approaches don't produce the same structural gains as whole worker community organizing. So, as Gig Workers United story demonstrates, the strength in numbers, which McAlevey argues is the only concrete challenge ordinary people have over elites, can only be built if the struggle goes beyond narrow workplace gains. And that's, and that's McAlevey's main argument, that organizers have to connect struggles inside and outside the workplace so that actions are supported 
by coalitions between the community and as many workers as possible. And so to reiterate, that's what makes Gig Workers United so promising in contrast to other top down, more top down efforts that are ongoing and shouldn't be entirely dismissed, but this deep organizing and the way in which their, their, like your approach has developed over the past few years from the Fudora campaign to this broader community unionism approach is really, I think, I don't know, uh, a good model to draw inspiration from as like within the labor movement in general. And Jennifer, I, I think you can speak to this better. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, when I first joined Food Stars United, um, I, I remember going to a meeting with a bunch of other workers and members, and we were talking about like uh, this problem that we had in, within Food Stars United and, and how to fix it. And I'm like, um, you know, I, I'm not saying anything. I'm silent. I have no idea. I don't know about organizing or about building a union. Like, I don't, I don't know any of that shit. And then somebody like really pointedly, like, you know, calls the room to quiet, makes like full eye contact with me and is like, what do you think we should do? And I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, no, mm -hmm. you do know. And, and that was when I learned uh, a really important idea. I learned that as, as a worker um, or as workers, we know our work. And so we know what needs to change and how to change it for things to be better. Um, and that was, I think, always part of Foodsters United, and it's something that we prioritize and have carried into Gig Workers United. This idea that the workers in, in the sector, in that job, know not only what needs to change, but how it can change. We know how to organize. We may not have the vocabulary, may not feel confident the way I did in that moment, but if we talk with each other, if we listen to each other, we will find the solutions. Um, and so, you know, I think that that leads the way that we organize um, and, and we organize with, with that idea at the forefront. And so we are connecting worker to worker and we do that on the street and we do it on the phone and while we're delivering in elevators. <laughs> and restaurant lobbies and even even you know on the street when it's raining hiding in like a little alcove trying not to get wet when you're smoking and talking with another worker about what what we have in common and as much as we work on on different vehicles what we have in common is is the same struggle and the same difficulties that impact our quality of life because of our work and so we organize in this way where we look for every opportunity possible to empower each other, to claim organizing, to claim our union, to make an impact on what our union looks like, what our union does, to be part of decision making, to be part of organizing, to share all of the ideas that we have, because we understand that we are the people who will have the solution. We are the people that will know what to do. Um, and, you know, we are the people who are doing that work. And for us, I think what that means, especially within the context of gig work, like this work can be very dehumanizing. It can be extremely isolating. Um, and I think a lot of us don't always feel proud of delivering on Uber Eats or delivering on Instacart. A lot of the time we feel very uh, dehumanized. But being united with our coworkers, being part of the union, claiming our ideas, our contributions, all of those things that we bring that shape it, it changes and shifts that. It doesn't make delivering less dehumanizing, but it does make being part of this community feel like something positive that improves the quality of our lives. And I think that's equally as important to the way that we organize as it is for us to have this community space where we know each other, we talk with each other, we learn from each other, and we feel a little bit better about our lives and what we do because we are together. Thank you for that. 
So what both of you have said so far um, has a lot of implications about um, the what constitutes Gig Workers United or about its nature as a as an institution, right? It's it's an institution. It's very grassroots, so it's in flux. It's very responsive to very immediate worker needs. And uh, I was uh, going to ask both of you to comment on the relationship between um, between Gig Workers United and the more established uh, labor movement. For instance, the, you know, you mentioned the Fedora struggle, uh, the, the relationship between the Foodsters and CUPW started during that, and it has developed and expanded since then. And so um, we were gonna talk about how that kind of um, community organizing and the more institutionalized, more established labor movement can relate to each other and some, to some extent lean on each other to make change. Um, Zoe, do you want to go first on that? Um, yeah, well, I, I guess I'll say a thought, I'll say it one bit, then maybe we can bounce off each other a bit. I, I guess just going right off um, what you were just saying, Jennifer, I, I think it feels worth kind of reiterating that like what you're describing is, I guess that importance is so, or it's so important on so many levels because as you're saying that more immediate sense of community and solidarity counters the atomization and the like dehumanization on a day-to-day -day basis. And as um, the Gig Workers United online presence demonstrates, uh, there are other ways in which you're kind of offering resources to help with more immediate issues that workers face. But simultaneously in building that sense of community and in providing or like reviving a sense of empowerment in, in this like within these workers, um, you're also building that base, that strong base that like deep organized base that McAlevey is emphasizing as necessary to push for that structural change. And I think to um, contrast it with the other like um, example of, it was a unionizing of gig workers in Ontario, um, which in my paper, I identified more as a mobilizing approach, which is not necessarily involving the workers themselves. Um, you know, there's the USCW deal and like, I just think without going too off topic, thinking about the approach that you're describing versus a closed door deal between the boss and the union that precludes collective bargaining. Like, I don't, I don't think that, I don't know, I, I guess the, the pair, like the, the differences in terms of what that is doing for workers in a more immediate sense um, just seems very, very stark. So I guess like the labor movement and the pre-existing unions alone can't, like are not enough. And that's why this community engaged approach is, and community unionism approach that is worker led is so kind of, I don't know, promising and powerful for lack of a better word. There are so many things that I wanna say about this question. <laughs> but um, so apps like Uber, I mean, like Uber was founded in 2009, like they've been around for over a decade, right? And for over a decade, they've been saying, the people who work on these apps are not real workers. They don't count. Like, so they don't need to have the right to unionize. They don't need to fall in under employment standards. Like they're not real workers. And then for almost as long as that, workers have been organizing and fighting to unionize or fighting for legislative recognition that we are real workers. 
And what I think is really interesting here in Ontario is, is so you've got workers on the ground in, in a lot of different ways who are organizing and who are saying, mm -hmm. we are real workers. We do belong in the union movement. We are part of the broader labor movement, whether our employer recognizes it or not. And here in Ontario, we have a broader labor movement who's like, fuck yeah, that's right. Yes, you do belong here. You are here. And, you know, for us within CUPW, we have the same, that same solidarity and that same support, right? And I think that um, the relationship between workers who are organizing, especially like a very community driven on the ground grassroots kind of organizing the way that we are, but who also have a formal tie to like traditional union. Um, I think that creates a lot of power, a lot of power to redefine um, new models for what organizing can look like and what organizing, especially precarious workers can look like. It can feel really intimidating to think of a, a sector mm -hmm. or, or a group of workers who are precarious, who are isolated, who don't share a, a workspace and be like, how do we organize those people? And I think, you know, like for CUPW, logistics delivery, like this is very common um, sort of type of worker, right? And then here we are defining what that can look like. And it can look like workers being part of a formal union, having membership, having delegates. It can look like workers um, fighting to unionize, building community, fighting for legislative things, fighting to certify, like doing all of the things that improve the quality of their lives without boundaries or restrictions while also having really concrete, serious support from the broader labor movement. And I think, you know, we sort of open this panel by talking about how gig work is, is very big and it, and it encompasses a lot of different types of workers. Um, and so this, this model of how to organize precarious workers through creating formal ties, through making space for community-driven, worker-driven organizing within traditional um, labor movement spaces, like this is how we will do this. And I don't just mean like gig workers, this is how all of us will organize for better work if we choose to take this path. And, and so here we have a bunch of audacious, really badass, hardworking delivery people who are helping to write the book for what organizing can look like for precarious workers. And we're doing that with CUPW, with the Ontario Federation of Labor, with all of these other amazing unions who, who say, yeah, fuck what Uber says. You are part of the broader labor movement. You are a worker and you will get your rights. And I think that's really exciting for what it means for us as working class people in Ontario for our future. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, now we're really headed in the direction of, of our, our third question for today, which was about how, um, I mean, there are different perspectives on this. For, for some of us, um, and, and for, some of, for a lot of the labor movement, um, precarity is a phenomenon, is something, you know, where, where we see in terms of a trend, that we see in terms of, well, precarity is on the rise and, and something has to be done about it. But for a lot of workers, precarity is, is like a part of the atmosphere. It's it's like um, it's not so much a, a trend as it's where you start um, in, in a lot of kinds of work, and um, so that there's a kind of a dialogue between what's going on in Gig Workers United and what's going on in the rest of the labor movement. I think Zoe's paper um, kind of helps frame the way that the advance of neoliberal capitalism um, after like you like you mentioned after the collapse of the Keynesian welfare state, uh, how neoliberal capitalism shapes worker organizing and precarity is a is a dimension of that. So you have um, some more comments on that. Oh, I'm, I'm referring to a part of your paper here. Yeah, well, I mean, there's so much and there's so much there's so much literature on this topic that like and, and always many different opinions or conclusions, but um, kind of what I alluded to at the beginning, the way in 
which like all these different factors uh, that we that are kind of encapsulated by the term neoliberalism and this idea of the collapse of the welfare state, um, which you know is often heralded as a golden age of institutionalized trade unionism and like the standard employment relationship and uh, public services, you know, on one hand, I, I do think it's worth mentioning that even in this golden age, there were always people that didn't reap the, didn't necessarily experience all the benefits of this, like, of the, the welfare state at its peak, particularly women and racialized workers, but at the same time, as neoliberalism, um, as neoliberal policies were enacted and as uh, private corporations kind of took on the roles of government in increasing areas of our lives, those um, vulnerabilities were, or like those hardships associated with that precarity of being excluded from like the working class and or at least partially have kind of been compounded by the increased vulnerability produced by neoliberal austerity. And I think that through, as things just, as it becomes harder and harder to survive and like thinking about how like apps like Uber, companies like Uber use this rhetoric of entrepreneurship and like self-employment as a way to promote their service or to recruit workers like I, I think that an important part of this whole complex situation of organizing and work the meaning of work in contemporary or like advanced capitalism is are like I guess what I've tried to say is that like there's always been a degree of precarity inherent to waged work in general but what is new is that like perhaps a growing precarity as well as the way that we're kind of left to deal with it on our own and companies like uber really um and and the internet in general re really reinforce um this idea that you can there's no excuse to not make money and survive even no matter how dehumanizing it is and no, no matter how little you're getting paid and i guess the individualistic competitive kind of atomized nature of that environment pits us against one another within the workplace as well as in a broader sense and so to bring it back to the labor movement and organizing you know i talked about business unionism and and kind of this focus on narrow workplace reforms but a big part of that is compromising for gains for a, for you know more senior workers at the expense of new members and all those compromises that individualism that permeates the labor movement like they weaken us in general as a whole and kind of reinforce the prevailing business unionism model which is serves the interests of the capitalist class and all this erodes the mass solidarity that we need to challenge it so like i think drawing from McLevy's or McLevy's um her mode of or her definition of whole worker organizing and you know the community unionism that gig workers united is kind of based in um this like, I guess successful unionism has never been only limited to the workplace and like gains, structural gains require these broader coalitions, but the, the current formation of capitalism and the way that it kind of seeps into all areas of our lives in a more kind of uh, transparent sense, I think, really reinforces this necessity more than ever and not just for gig workers but for all of us yeah th thank you zoe um 
that sort of uh, brings me to a thought that um, uh, just just a heads up from both of you. I'm just going to add uh, this point to our plan before we get to the fourth uh, the question that we had planned after this. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, you talk about uh, it. Just brings me to the fact that at Gay Workers United, they have a very Jennifer, you and and your coworkers all have a very clear idea of what your employer is trying to do. And I think that I think largely there's a perception out there that Uber is just sort of exploiting some loopholes or, you know, that they've just like kind of like in their kind of whole disruptor narrative that they've uh, found a way to have a leaner operation and stuff like that. But you've said something that I that we've talked about before, which is more to do with uh, with them achieving market dominance in order to reshape uh, policy uh, and in order to change uh, the nature of the employment relationship. Do you want to uh, talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So I said earlier that Uber was founded in 2009, right? So for me, that means that on the heels of the first economic crisis in my lifetime, this company came out of the woodwork that was like, oh, you need extra money and you need like low barrier employment. We've got that for you. And a lot of people like me, you know, heard that, heard that pitch, this pitch, like your work will be flexible. You can do it around childcare. You can do it around your other job. You can make enough to pay this bill or that thing you're behind on, like it's going to be good for you. Um, you know, and then, and then workers start, start doing it. And, you know, a year, year and a half in, they're like, oh, fuck, this really is not what I thought it was going to be, <laughs> you know? And, and, as workers working in this job, I think one of the very first things we learn is that flexibility, which, you know, app employers say to the world is that like, um, the reason that gig workers can't have workers rights is because we give them flexibility and they want it so much, we can't compromise flexibility for workers rights. Um, but as a worker, I think one of the first things that you learn is that it's not that the work is flexible, it's that you are required to be flexible around the work. You are required to be flexible for the app. You know, I, I don't, um, in, in my, my ideal life, I, I would not choose to work every Friday, Saturday night. I would like to go to the theater. I would like to see a movie with my friends. But I, I work at that time because those are the two most lucrative times of the week to work. Um, and that's not that's not flexibility, right? Um, and so, like, I bring that up to say when we talk about the the narrative of the gig economy, when we talk about what app employers are doing, um, they've tested the waters. Uh, you know, they started in 2009 in the U.S. In 2015 in Canada, when Rideshare came here, they they started testing the waters by saying. Um, the way that these workers work is different, is new. And so they don't need traditional rights and protections. And, and we all, you know, we all bought it because it sounded really good as a worker or as a, a customer, or even as someone who is just interested in the future and future of work, it sounded kind of good, um, but it's, it's not. And I think it's really easy to pull back the veil over that narrative that apps use and to see that there is a very clear and very malicious intent behind this. You know, the gig economy is not about food delivery. It's not about taxi services. It's not about that. This is an intentional and well-planned move to change the terms for what work looks like for as many people as, as is possible. You know, in, in California, um, Uber and, and Lyft and DoorDash and Amazon even contributed about $220 million to bring in a, a ballot measure that would lock workers out of rights and protections. And they, and they won and they did that and it's terrible. Um, you know, workers have talked about how it's 
made their, their work worse, their lives worse. And members of the labor movement have talked about how it sets a terrible precedent. And uh, in January or February of this year, a copycat version of Prop 22 was filed, another ballot measure, same path, very similar language to make healthcare workers, gig workers, to carve healthcare workers out of rights and protections. And so like as someone who's who's working in this industry, who's like here in the movement, it's, it's really easy for me to see that this is an intentional move to reduce and to, to roll back to something that I think has not existed for, for a lot of us in our lifetimes, um, you know, conditions of work. Something that I've learned being a part of the, the labor movement is this idea that employment standards are meant to be like a sturdy, a sturdy floor and we stand on them together and we reach up and, and you know, for, for things that are better. And each of us will be reaching up towards different things depending on our work, our collective agreements, our bargaining, but, but we all stand together like in this strong floor that we're rooted in. And what, what app employers are working to do and what we see here in Ontario with the Ford government, um, they're looking to turn that floor into quicksand. And instead of us reaching above and fighting for and winning better, we'll be pulled deep within it. And I think the, the consequences of that are, are that, you know, we don't have the social safety nets. We don't have the social provisions to take care of each other when that happens on a mass level. And from the point of view of, of you know, being a trade unionist or a member of the broader labor movement, how long will it take us to climb out of that quicksand? How long will it take us to rebuild that floor? Um, and so like, I guess maybe to summarize what I'm saying is, is that it doesn't, I don't think it matters if you're a gig worker or not. Um, and, and I know that it might not be as easy to, to pull back that veil if you're not a gig worker. Um, but, but the truth is that this, this intentional attempt to change the terms of what work looks like and how that impacts quality of life for working class people is, is coming for you too. Um, it doesn't, you know, maybe, maybe it won't be today, maybe it'll be next year, but it is coming for you too. And one day you will be a gig worker. Maybe we'll all be in a worse position than we are now. But that's that's the reality. And, and so conversations like the ones that we're having mm -hmm. today about how to organize and why we organize workers, because the power is in workers united together. Like there's more of us than there are of the boss. There are more of us, you know, we we can stop this from happening if we are united together and united across sectors unionized, non-unionized, gig workers, teachers, healthcare providers. We hold this line and we say, you know, here in Ontario, here in our labor movement, we are not going to regress like that. We recognize that employment standards applies to all people who work and we won't go it back any farther than that. I don't know, I hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you for bringing us so so concretely to the here and now because our fourth question that we were going to talk about is is to do with everybody who's in the audience wondering uh you know who's hopefully inspired and excited about the interplay of all these issues but also kind of thinking okay well what am i going to do about this in the short term how am i going to support this struggle so we thought we would talk a little bit about what's at play in the provincial election here in ontario um, and I'm throwing that open to both of you, Zoe and Jennifer. I have many thoughts on that. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the first thing that I would offer is that um, change doesn't come from voting, which doesn't mean you shouldn't vote, but it, it doesn't come from voting. It doesn't come from our government. Change comes from organizing. And this is a, a pitch, really sincere one, that if you want to shape um, what our work looks like, if you want to shape 
our future. You do that by organizing in your community, with your neighbors, at your school, with your classmates, in your workplace. We organize, and that's how we win change. Um, but there's a part of the election that impacts that, which is like, yeah, the policy is not what what changes the future for us. It, it's the work that we do to shape that policy. But at the same time, who the government is significantly impacts the conditions that we organize in. So like for gig workers who are organizing, these are people who are precariously employed. Their employment is not uh, secure. You can't, you can't count on what you'll make next week or next month, or even that you'll have a job next month. Um, many of us don't have status. Many of us, um, you know, work with injuries. And despite that, we find time and we make sacrifices in our lives to organize. Um, and so who, who the government is can shape how difficult or how easy that organizing work is for us. And so when it, you know, when it comes time to think about who we're voting for in the election, taking a look at how governments have impacted workers, has legislation or policy actually been what workers were organizing for and, and fighting to win? Or is it something that workers are saying is bad for them? I think is a really, really important thing to take into consideration. And I would also offer too, that if you value worker organizing, you value working class people using their voices and bringing in changes that, that tangibly improve the quality of their lives, then also uplift organized workers' voices. Listen to what we are saying and allow that to shape what you think the best step forward is. Thank you. There was one other thing I was hoping that you'd touch on, which was um, about sort of from the, speaking of policy, there was a kind of interesting sequence of events. Uh, was it in late March, late March and early April? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just in terms of like really concretely speak about uh, Bill 88 and the, the policy divide that's actually at play in this. There really is a difference. Um, between what the different parties are activating that's that's going to make a difference on the street. And so, uh, Jennifer, I think you know what I'm talking about. I can talk about that. So to start maybe just like ever so slightly earlier, um, and I know Zoe talks about it in her paper, but gig workers wrote something uh, in 2021 called the Gig Workers Bill of Rights. And really, truly, it was written by workers. And, and it was workers clearly stating what would full employee status, full workers' rights and protections, what would that look like for gig workers? You know, an attempt to answer that question of like, is it possible? And also an attempt to like share vision with others who can't see that vision. Um, and we wrote it, it was hard work, but we did it. And, um, Something that happened not long after that is that the uh, Peggy Sattler, who's um, part of the NDP, um, brought forward uh, a, a bill that would end misclassification. And this is important because that's one of the demands in the Gig Workers Bill of Rights that we should be or we are entitled to correct classification. Um, and our government voted no for it and opposition voted yes for it and it did not pass and it and it has not come you know come into policy while that was happening our government was doing consultations with a committee called the OREC committee and that committee was oh a sham of a committee created to lend lend uh, support to um, Uber's lobbying because mm -hmm. Uber has been lobbying all provincial governments since uh, December of 2020. Um, as the as the OREC committee released their report, uh, the the Minister of Labor, Monty McNaughton, um, said that he was putting apps on notice. He was going to put an end to misclassification and mistreatment of workers. And he brought forward something called Bill 88, 
Um, and Bill 88 is, is what Uber lobbied for. It doesn't put an end to anything. It doesn't give workers any rights or protections. In fact, it, it enshrines something very deeply problematic in, in Ontario and in our law. Um, part of Prop 22 in California, Uber uh, created and sort of brought in this idea of engaged time. And so engaged time is like roughly defined as like the time when I have food in my bag you know, like when I picked up a delivery and I'm taking it to a customer, or if you did ride share, the time when you have the, the passenger in your car, but it's, it's not all of the time that I'm at work. It's part of the time. Um, in the U.S., uh, a few years ago, Uber and Lyft paid for a study to find out how much time workers spent at work that was engaged time. Um, and the study found that only 40% of the time that workers were at work was engaged time. Um, and the city of Toronto has since done a very similar study and found the same, the same amount of time. Uh, and so, you know, we go to work and the majority of our time at work is unpaid, unengaged time. Um, and this bill, Bill 88, called the mm -hmm. <laughs> Working for Workers Act, uh, says to bad bosses and employers, you don't have to abide by employment standards. You don't have to abide by minimum wage. We have created a new definition of minimum wage, a definition where you as the boss control how much of the time a worker is working counts as working time. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> like, that is not a future. That does not make sense for workers. Um, Bill 88 uh, was publicized and, and came out four days after a gig worker named Sarab, who's a member of Gig Workers United, got a ruling from the Employment Standards Officer, an employee of the, the Ministry of Labor. And so Sarab did, you know, what many misclassified workers in Ontario try and do. He, he experienced an injustice at work. And so he, he filed a complaint with the, um, the Ministry of Labor and an officer investigated it and found not only was his complaint uh, like valid, but above that, that Uber was engaging in misclassification and that Uber was an employer of employees. And, you know, so this ruling that comes from the Ministry of Labor, from Monty McNaughton's own ministry, deeply conflicts with this piece of legislation that Monty McNaughton has brought forward, Bill 88. And as, as gig workers, as people who, you know, because Sarab was not on his own when he did that, that is not the point of collective action. Everybody at Gig Workers United was supporting and helping and making sure that he knew that he had, you know, that everybody had his back. And so for this, for this huge group of people to see their coworker win something that's never been won before in Ontario, and then see the, the minister of that ministry be like, yeah, no, that didn't happen. I don't, I don't care. I'm gonna bring in legislation that makes things worse for you. To be told by the Ministry of Labor that we are in fact entitled to employment standards under the law as they are now. And then to see our Minister of Labor and our Premier say, well, we're gonna change the law. We're gonna amend it so that you are not covered under those employment standards the way they are now. As working class people, as people who are organizing, as precarious workers who struggle to do all of this, that is deeply offensive. We sent Minister McNaughton an email, an, an official letter, asking him to uphold the law and the ruling of the employment standards officer. Uh, he didn't reply to it. And then the next business day, like the next work day, he announced Bill 88. And he has still not replied to our email. <laughs> I don't think he will. Um, things are tough for gig workers. I think things are tough in Ontario for working class people. But I, I come back to, and I don't want to leave us on that, that hard note. I come back to organizing is how we change that. Organizing is how we impact and we shape our futures. 
And we do that by shaping the communities that we're part of and contributing to each other's you know, day-to-day -day quality of life. But we also do that by shaping, creating, influencing policy or winning unions or collective agreements, successfully negotiating and bargaining. Like there are so many ways that through organizing, we are the people who create good solutions for the future. Um, and so as much as things are, are difficult and dark now, and I think we all kind of feel our own version of that, I think there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of hope in Gig Workers United and these, these really, really amazing, capable, critical people who are saying, the most evil company in the world, we don't care. We'll stand up to them. We'll say no. And we're going to win. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I think Zoe has a couple of thoughts to add on that. While she's doing so, uh, I hope that people are thinking about uh, posing their questions and comments. Uh, you can use the chat to do so, or you can raise your hand and we'll get to that uh, in just a few minutes. We're going to, it's good. We've saved uh, just about a half an hour for, for Q and A. It's going to be great. Well, that was, I don't know, such a great train of thought, Jennifer, that I, I, I it's, hard, it's a hard one to follow, but I really do just want to reiterate kind of what you're saying that while, or part of what you're saying that while, while gig work right now seems so extreme and so kind of like, distinctly precarious compared to our um, compared to other jobs that maybe seem safe for now. I really want to stress for, I guess, everyone listening that like the, the signs of that direction in so many industries and in so many fields um, are already there. And I know that anyone here who's a contract instructor, anyone here that's a creative, like trying to make it in the creative industries, I mean, there is like, countless other examples these jobs that we we see as professional and safe but are are really heading down this incredibly precarious and like they just share many parallels with this model where it's like flexible if you're in the sense of either flexible around your work if you're willing to kind of be ready to drop anything at all times and perform on a um very specific kind of constant level um, as well as like, I just totally lost that thought, but um, I, I, wanna, I wanna move to the Q and A, but all to say like, we, this, this precarity that as Jennifer kind of alluded to, we all experience it in different ways and, and not, comparable ways, but also like in ways that are intertwined. And like, even if we feel safe now, we have to all work to organize and build these bases because to, to challenge and to like build this solidarity on a broader level to challenge the, the shrinking class of people whose interests are ruling our lives and are destroying the planet. So um, not to oversimplify, but um, this, yeah, thank you so much. I will, I'll end it there. Okay. Thank you both very much for your, for your presentations today. I, uh, like Jennifer mentioned in the, Scott, in, the, in the chat, I am also a big fan of Q&A. Um, I'm sure people are pretty excited. Please don't be shy about raising your hands. Um, in the meantime, I think we can explore. I mean, we're, we're, we ended up on a high note there and it makes me think about uh, victory, right? Um, we love to declare victories on the left and uh, we have lots of different ideas about what constitutes a victory. And I think it's pretty hard for people uh, for this struggle particularly to, to understand what victories going to look like. 
That didn't sound like a question, did it? But <laughs> I think the question is when you when you when you hear the word victory or when you picture in your mind what is the um, you know the desirable state that we're going to get to with this struggle, um, how do you how do you define that? I mean, for me, that feels really easy to define. Um, and that's the people, the people who feel the victory or the people who experience the thing feel like it's a victory, you know? Um, sometimes, sometimes folks think that Food Stars United, you know, we won the right to unionize. That's precedent setting. It's never happened in, in on Canada before. And Fedora declared bankruptcy because of the pandemic. And so, you know, sometimes folks are like, oh, well, that wasn't really a victory, was it? Um, but to workers, to workers, it feels like when it is one, we united together, we met each other, we made each other's lives better for a period of time. We did something really hard by challenging ourselves to, to, to look at our lives and our community and our society and envision one, one that's different. And then to believe, to trust in each other that if we organized, we could achieve it. And we did. And, and then more than that, when, when Fedora left Canada because of the power that we built, because of the collective worker power, we, we won a settlement, um, which was for all workers in Canada, not just the union workers. Um, and, and it was based, um, the payment was based on the, uh, the, the federal WEP program. So it was also a settlement that was like easy to define and understand. It was a, a version of severance pay for, for gig workers, for precarious workers, because those workers united together and built power against a multinational corporation that has billions of dollars, like to workers. It's a huge victory. In fact, it's like six victories. And it's also the, the bedrock of, of what we built so that we could define and celebrate more victories. So for me, it, that question, the answer is, is the workers define what victory is and we celebrate it and our lives are better for it. Thank you. So I've got two hands up. Do you want to chime in on this question before we go there? We could let the hands go. I, I was thinking though about just what Jennifer said reminded me of like the notion of victory and kind of the way that like even the Ford government now framed that working so-called working for workers act as a historic win for and first for workers and like like as you're saying those we we i guess part of this reformist context that we're operating within now is this kind of being forced into this position where we need to or we feel like we need to take what we can get and that's like a big aspect of those compromises that weaken the movement overall and so I think that what you're describing and kind of like understanding victory is more nuanced and not necessarily like just meeting the kind of institutional requirements is uh like all, victory on all those levels is just seems I would agree, uh, but I want to, yeah, I want to hear the, the questions. Thank you. Uh, the first hand I see is Deborah Steenstra. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm coming from Guelph, from the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional lands of the Atawandaran peoples. Um, but my question is about a research project that I'm involved in with the Work Wellness Institute on disabled gig workers. Um, in particular. And I wondered um, uh, to what extent you see those intersections of disability and gig working coming together. I can see it 
um, in the conversation that you two have been having in your discussions of being injured on the job, uh, the lack of protections that's noted in the gig workers bill of rights, um, you know, unsafe working conditions more generally, but I'd be really curious how you think about um, what might be some of the issues for disabled gig workers and what might be some of the ways in which in our research we could um, support uh, your work and in particular support um, some of the links between uh, disability and gig work. I can answer. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna start with something that's like not quite your question, but I'll get there. Um, when I when I talk with gig workers all over the world, there's is one thing that's really really clear, and it doesn't matter the app or or the, um, you know, the type of gig work, whether it's rideshare or food delivery or shopping. It's this is always the truth. It's always the same in every country. The app employers intentionally create this job and and the and the, the workers who do it, they intentionally make sure that marginalized migrant workers are the largest um, set of workers in this workforce. Um, and so I think there is also a parallel there. The apps look for disabled workers, look for workers who come from um, intergenerational poverty. They, they look for people for whom it is most difficult to raise our voices. And they create uh, this job, this, this sector, uh, all of the, the narratives that they, they use around it. They make it as hard as is possible for us to feel legitimate or, or be seen as legitimate when we talk about the things that we experience. And, and so I, I think that it is very clear that gig work targets disabled workers and but I would say like a slightly different type of gig work than the one that that I do right um, and there's definitely a huge parallel between getting injured on work and and then needing support um, but I think if you want to support gig workers who are going through this um, the real fight is in ending this classification so why, why do apps continue to be able to get away with misclassifying us? Why do they continue to be able to get away with um, not abiding by the law, not protecting us, not giving us workers' rights and protections, not giving us access to health and safety nets, to WSIB, to, to all of those benefits that are necessary? Why does that continue to happen? So Rob is not the first worker who's filed an Employment Standard, Standards Act claim in Ontario. He is, however, the first worker to have received this ruling. Um, I think some of the most meaningful research that we can do is research into why are apps able to operate in the way that they have been? Why is nobody stepping in? I hope that's helpful. Very much so, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks, Deborah, for your question. Um, I don't know if you've published anything yet um, on the research that you're doing, but if you have a link to share or something like that, we'd, I'm sure we'd all welcome that. It's a work in progress, and we're going to be talking a bit about it at a conference on June the 9th. So I could give a link to that panel, not now, but I can send it to you after that. And, and, and the project is a one-year project, so it's um, just at the beginning stages. So it'd be good to keep the conversation open. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, I see Ryan Lum has his hand up. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ryan Lum. I'm, uh, uh, I just started as the um, UR external organizing here at CPW. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Chloe, for uh, what was a really great presentation. And and um, I'm just like that. Yes, yeah, CPW has engaged in in something um, really amazing and innovative in in um, in gig worker organizing. And I'm just like really proud to be be taking part in that. 
you know, even if it's like, you know, from the from the sidelines, I guess you could say. Um, so I just wanted to say that, and uh, it was a really great presentation, and thank you very much. Sorry, more of a more of a comment there. Oh, we do appreciate it, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, un until the next hand comes up. Oh, Jennifer, very good. <laughs> I, I should use the reactions more. I, I really like the energy that that, that, that gives to the proceedings. Um, waiting for another. Oh, great. We've got a hand up from uh, Gagandeep. Please go ahead, Gagandeep. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. Um, Zoe and uh, Jennifer, I have a question for you, Zoe. Um, um, as part of the research, uh, how do you see or how do you predict the, the model that we have established or we are witnessing through Gig Worker United outpouring into any other sector? And where do you think is the likelihood of establishing that sort of community organizing and where we can achieve uh, success? with this model in today's reality, yeah. Well, thank you so much for that question. And it's definitely one that I'm, I think about a lot. So I definitely don't have a complete, won't have a complete answer to it. But I think like, if, if we, like bearing in mind that Gig Workers United and Foodsters United like have, built such a strong organization um despite working in a an environment where the nature of the work itself is not only dispersed but like atomized and competitive and um very like fast-paced at times of high demand and in in general has been identified as being like like that gig work model being a significant barrier to like traditional organizing tactics I feel like what comes to mind initially is like well if they if they did it then what's what's stopping those of us like what's stopping those of us beyond what what we're defining as the gig economy here and like even um for example you know with in my union in qp4600 here for rtas we're going into bargaining next year two years of the pandemic, no one's, or two, three years, no one's really, we're not able to have meetings in person, attendance is down, we're not able to, it's really hard to reach out to people. And I think like drawing inspiration from like what Jennifer and other um, members of Gig Workers United describe, you know, standing on the streets, talking to people, in between trips or perhaps in our case in between classes or on their way or you know fill in to any other um sector that needs this kind of community base i think which is like all of them i think that that kind of going in that sense that is a tried and true union tactic like talking to um the workers and using those conversations to not only build that base but to inform bargaining and like demands i think that like yeah from my perspective i think that seeing the ways in which i guess that that aspect overcoming those kind of spatial barriers as well as um like as i've kind of been uh repeating throughout this the the kind of multifaceted approach of as jennifer is describing supporting each other for employment standards complaints um and labor relations and and you know aiming for like official union recognition and the establishment of a bargaining union as well as or bargaining unit i mean as well as like building that community and providing resources, engaging in mutual aid initiatives, like all those kind of multiple areas in which all of our, in, in which like the issues all kind of overlap. I think that in general drawing inspiration 
from that very holistic community engaged approach is really um, the direction that we all need to go in. I hope that kind of answers your question. Thanks, Gag and, uh, and Ryan for those questions, both of which sort of touched on the idea of uh, innovative approaches to organizing, which made me think of something that we haven't mentioned yet today, but I think I will, because it's great to see so many people posting resources and references in the chat. Uh, I have one more, and um, it's the order in days action, which is another way for people to um, support uh, app-based courier organizing. So Jen, maybe you can explain that while I put the link up. Yeah, so order in days is something that we do. We've been doing since Foodstores United. Um, and it achieves a few things. So, so the idea is like you place an order on whatever app, doesn't matter. Um, maybe, it, you know, using Corner Shop or Instacart to get your groceries. Maybe it's Skip or Uber Eats to get your supper. Maybe even you're, you're taking a, a rideshare ride. They all work for order in days in different ways. Um, but the idea is that like you as somebody who recognizes that workers are organizing and you wanna support that and it's hard um, and you wanna, you wanna give workers a, a little bit of like a, a lift up on an individual basis. So when you place an order and there are instructions in the kit, um, you would have a chat with the worker and you know you would ask them, how, how has today been? Um, you know, how, how are things going? How is pay? <laughs> um, you know, these questions where they're gonna tell you a bit about, about what it's like to work this job. And you're gonna listen and show them um, you know, that you recognize that they are real people doing real work. Um, back when, when we were Foodsters United, I joined uh, after order in days had already started. I didn't even know what it was. And um, I was delivering something. Uh, it was summertime, which I, I love hot weather. I, I get real hot and I hate it. I'm sweating. Like it's, I'm just miserable in the summertime. So I was not having a good time. Um, plus it was slow. I hadn't had a delivery in a while. I hadn't made enough money. And in my head, I was calculating how much extra I would have to work that day to make enough that day. Um, and I go to deliver to this, to this person and uh, she comes outside and she's really friendly and she greets me um, and she asks me how I'm doing. And she's like, it's hot, your face is red. You must be having a hard day. And I'm like, yeah, I am, I am. And she, she made it safe. She gave me permission to, to be frustrated and to express that to her, like it was okay. And in that moment, I felt seen by somebody who saw my work, my effort, which is, is something that doesn't get seen by the apps or, or by most of the folks that I interact with when I'm at work. And it made me feel good. It made me feel less dehumanized. It made me feel seen. It made me feel like a person. And I often don't feel like a person at work. Um, and of course, part of order in days is tipping and tipping well. And so I got a good tip and that made me a little bit less sad about not having earned enough money that day. <laughs> but I, you know, like, you know, sometimes when you're going through something tough, when something nice happens, you, you hold on to it for a while, maybe a little bit longer than you would if things weren't as tough as they are. I held on to the way that she made me feel for weeks, for weeks when I would go out to work and I would deliver and be like, hey, you know what? Maybe it's just not that bad because somebody saw me. Um, and so that's, that's what we're asking you to do with order in days. We're asking you to validate and see and acknowledge gig workers to give us that, that little bit of support in knowing that somebody who is not us knows how hard our work is and that we are trying our best and also that we're organizing. And, and another you know, really lovely thing that you can do with order in days, when you bring the conversation around to talking about Gig Workers United, about workers organizing, about unionizing, is you can show the workers that you're talking to that there is broader support for our organizing, that other people recognize that we are part of the labor movement, that we deserve workers' rights and protections. 
Um, and I think, I think that can be really meaningful. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a bit of a reminder that we're really not alone in this fight. Other people are invested, other people care if we win, and other people validate and know that we are just in wanting full workers' rights. Thank you, that's really great. Um, it's just 1.23 by my clock, um, but I, th I think we've, oh, I see Jane Stinson's hand up. So let's, uh, let's hear Jane's question or comment. No. I didn't actually have one. I was only clapping. That was a clapping emoji. <laughs> oh, we love those too. That's very good. Very good. Well then, uh, I, I agree with Jane that we've done a lot of, we've done most of what we set out to do today, which was to kind of situate the Gig Workers United struggle um, within, you know, those kind of, um, that kind of continuum of organizing modes that Zoe put forward in her paper and we get to talk a bit about the specificities of that struggle and how everybody in the audience can can directly support the efforts um, uh, you know in a number of ways it's great to see all the activity in the chat and I want to thank you both very much for your presentations today and I'll turn it over to Justin. Thank you Kevin uh, and of course thank you uh, so much Zoe and uh, and thank you especially to Jennifer for uh, for offering uh, 90 minutes of, of your uh, time uh, for this today and thank you to everyone who uh, uh, who has listened in and and asked questions or or just listened and, and participated uh, I think uh, this is hopefully the beginning of of what will be precarious uh, era. And, uh, and I, I think Jennifer's uh, uh, comments have made me actually more optimistic uh, than I've been in, uh, in some time uh, uh, thinking about this. Um, I want to uh, remind everyone uh, in the audience, uh, if you're interested in uh, the Institute of, of Political Economy or the Work and Labor Program, the Diploma Program, uh, please contact uh, Tabitha Malouin, uh, who can, uh, I think, put her uh, email address in the chat uh, or look at the, the website, uh, website for the Institute of Political Economy at Carleton uh, University. And I'd like to uh, remind you to please tune in May 24th uh, from 12 to 1.30 p.m. on Zoom uh, for the second uh, session in our series, uh, Workers Organizing Against Precarity, Gendered Norms, Workplace Harassment and Strategies for Resistance and Waitressing, work. Uh, this, uh, this webinar will look at Taylor Maudlin's research on why sexual harassment continues to be so prevalent for female waitstaff. Uh, Caitlin Amatulovic and Andrea Babington will share their strategies for resistance as workers and organizers trying to counter sexualized violence and precarity uh, in the service industry. Uh, so uh, thank you again, uh, Jennifer, Zoe, and Kevin. Uh, uh, fantastic uh, moderating. Uh, and great questions uh, from the audience. Uh, and uh, Jane has put the link uh, to the next uh, session in the chat uh, as well. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone, uh, stay, uh, stay safe, stay cool uh, today if you're in our part of Ontario. And uh, this was a uh, um, wonderful uh, first webinar. So thank you all very much. Thanks.